One of the unfortunate aspects of modern rangeland management is invasive plants. And today in Integrated Rangeland Management, uh, we're going to talk about some aspects of invasive plants and ways to think about managing them. So this is Karen Launchbot at the University of Idaho. First off, why, why do we even care about invasive plants or, or um, invasive species? Well, first of all, it's, it's a concern because it might uh, signal a decline in the ecosystem, and that decline could be reduced biodiversity or beauty of the ecosystem, which could affect economic losses. It's interesting that this is, that weeds are a problem for all kinds of landowners, rural landowners, private landowners, state, federal, anyone that owns or manages land, weeds can be an important issue for. And therefore, it's a rather uniting feature because um, to... to manage weeds we got to bring all people together whether they be farmers fishermen ranchers cyclers uh, just those who enjoy the the native lands are all concerned about invasive species one last thing is there's something you can't leave well enough alone you can't just say oh it's okay I'll get to it in the future because every every moment you wait there's an unmanaged time where the um, the species will spread rapidly and increasingly and silently so I'm going to talk mostly about invasive plants in this discussion, but don't forget that there's invasive animals, microbes, and viruses. So think of invasive animals that you know. That some that we deal with up here in the northwest are like zebra mussel, uh, but also throughout the west there's a lot of invasive birds like uh, starlings, for example, uh, non-native species that are, are really starting to take over. What about microbes? Can you think of any microbes that might be a problem? Again, up here in the northwest, we worry about white pine blister rust. That was an invasive microbe, a rust. And then what about diseases? What, what about plant, uh, diseases like West Nile virus? That's uh, caused a lot of issues with uh, land management in the west. So if you want to know more about uh, not just plants, but animals, microbes, and viruses that have come into the U.S., uh, you might look at invasivespecies.gov. So let's get some terminology straight. We're going to talk about weeds, noxious weeds, exotic, annual, or exotic alien introduced, and non-indigenous and invasive species. So what's a weed? Of course, a lot of people think about a weed as a, as a plant out of place. It's a plant with little value that isn't uh, being productive where it is. So species that compete with crops or native species could be considered weeds. They're troublesome, they're pests, they affect health or productivity of the landscape. So just there are a whole a category of just kind of bad plants. The book definition of a weed is a plant that interferes with the growth and of desirable plants and that is unusually persistent and pernicious. They negatively impact human activity and are there set for undesirable. So interesting in this definition is that they affect human activity weed that term is not an ecological term it's a human term so we are the ones that designate weeds we furthermore designate noxious weeds noxious doesn't simply mean deleterious in this case noxious has a very specific meaning it came from the noxious weed law the noxious weed act of uh, 1974 so in that act um, certain plants were called noxious and once they were declared noxious by a county, a region, a state, or the nation, then there was a series of activities that had to come along with that Noxious Weed Act. Now, I actually think that Noxious Weed Act was, was quite a productive and well thought out act. So here's some elements of it. Here are four interesting things uh, that were part of the Noxious Weed Law that are applied to state, local, and federal agencies. Just, just four of the major ones. The first one was that the law declared that people who are overseeing weed control programs need to be properly trained. So this fostered uh, uh, many training programs and certification programs that people have to have if they're working with herbicides and weed control. So it, it really made the whole situation more trackable and more safe. Second was that the Noxious Weed Law um, established ways to have money or budgets for weed control in these agencies. And then an, another beneficial part was that it established a process where cooperative weed management agreements could happen among landowners and that could also uh, provide a venue for, for weed control. In fact, at least in the state of Idaho, you, you can't get money from the state for weed control unless you're part of a coordinated and cooperative re weed management area. So those are all the kind of positive reinforcement aspects. There also is a, a stick, the, a negative 
side to this. If if you have weeds on your land, if landowners have weeds on their land and they're not taking care of those noxious weeds or they're not trying to take care of them, they can face fines. And and in many states, noxious weed laws provide that if if the weed supervisor comes by and sees noxious weeds on land, the county can um, can control those weeds and then put a, a lien on taxes so that the landowner has to pay for that control. So that that's not done very often because in order for county weed supervisors to get access to land and really get cooperation among landowners, that's not going to help if that weed manager goes around all the time and just uh, gives people fines for not controlling weeds. So it's there. It's kind of the stick in the whole carrot and stick approach, but it's not used very often, at least as I see it. There are noxious weed um, lists at the national level, the state and county levels even, and, and in each state they have a way to decide which noxious weed um, weeds go on the list. And just here's some characteristics as an example from Idaho. The weed must be present but not native to Idaho, so there's no plants on the Idaho list that are native. They have to be potentially more harmful than beneficial. We'll talk later about how some weeds have beneficial aspects. And in order for a list to get on the noxious weed list, in order for a weed to get on the noxious weed list, they have to be more harmful than beneficial. Eradication, eradication has to be possible economically and physically feasible. You know, for example, uh, uh, cheatgrass is a bad weed, but it's not on the noxious weed list because we could never eradicate it. We couldn't physically get rid of it. And then finally, it has to be somewhat economically feasible. The potential adverse impacts of the weed must exceed the cost of control. Many weed laws, and in Idaho's is not an exception, we, weeds come in different levels of concern. The first are the ones that are just really early in their invasion into the state. They're, they're still in small populations, and the real key then is to detect them and quickly respond and, and hopefully eradicate those. So those are EDRR. They're called the EDRR species early detection, rapid response. Once a weed gets more well-established in a region or a state, then control might be an effort. It, it doesn't mean you're gonna completely get rid of it, but get it down to a level that it's, it's kind of under control. And finally, there's some plants that are just really um, widespread and they're on the, the, the third detection, which is just to contain. So we may not try to control them within an area, but we're gonna try to contain the, the spread or the edges of them. So three, three different levels to think about where control happens. So the spread of these weeds and the damage they cause um, can be lessened by proper identification of the plant and knowing which of these categories it's in and then also handling it when you're moving from place to place. Just again, as an example, here's Idaho's noxious weed law. We have 67 weeds on our noxious weed list. And uh, if you want to know more about this, this go ahead and you could... Uh, Google Idaho's Noxious Weeds from the University of Idaho, or you can click on this PDF, enter this PDF, and it will take you to a full version of this book that outlines each of the 67 um, noxious weeds. Exotic, alien, introduced, or non-indigenous is another set of terms that all mean roughly the same thing. They mean they're not from around here. In, when we talk about plants that are not native, we usually mean they're not native to North America, but they could be not native to a specific region, like the Pacific Northwest or a specific state. They could not be native to Idaho. Um, they were brought here either accidentally or on purpose or for a specific purpose. So, for example, in Idaho, there are 800 exotic plants, and hundreds of these were introduced crops or ornamental plants. They were brought here specifically for uh, for a reason. Others showed up accidentally and, and really didn't become a problem, and others showed up for one reason or another and really became a problem and then became a weed. So in the U.S., human activity is the primary means by which invasive species got here. Remember, sometimes it was just accidental. It might have been seeds of, of weeds that were in grain or feed. For, for example, cheatgrass um, was apparently brought here just as an aberrant seed in, uh, in a, a bunch of grain that was planted. Uh, also, ships, when, when we were bringing equipment over, and still today, uh, they, they are often... Um, ship containers that might have invasive species in them. There might be uh, soil or water that was used to balance the ship for ship ballast that included seeds. So for many reasons, accidentally, 
these uh, these seeds might have been brought over and introduced. Um, others were brought here perfectly uh, for a specific reason, uh, perfectly good reason, like ornamentals. Uh, yellow flag uh, lily is a, or I'm sorry, yellow flag iris is a good one. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's a beautiful flower. And uh, uh, other plants like leafy spurge was brought here um, as an ornamental plant. Some were brought here for erosion control. Uh, plants like um, reed canary grass that's really common up here in the northwest was brought in to stabilize stream banks and it does a really good job it's so good at stabilizing that it doesn't let any other species in and really forms a monoculture so it's become weedy other plants were brought here because they have forage value they were brought here as uh, to produce uh, forage for livestock uh, such as smooth grown was brought here so some were brought here on purpose some accidentally Invasive plants is a little bit different. Not all, I mean, all plant, all invasive plants might be weedy, uh, but they are not necessarily on the noxious weed list. So invasive species will outcompete not native species and spread to dominate um, plant communities. Well, we often talk about forming a monoculture where we don't like plants that really take over and, and our and a ecosystem becomes extremely dominated by one species. Uh, those species uh, exhibit very weedy characteristics. They can be grasses, forbs, shrubs, trees. And in this picture, uh, th this is a picture of juniper coming in and invading into native rangeland. And so in this case, the juniper plant is native. So invasive plants can be either native or exotic. And the reason that it's starting to invade now and it didn't historically is because the fire regime has changed. And also there's probably climatic conditions that have changed. So when the world changes, and when the fire regime changes, when activities change, native plants can also become invasive. Other characteristics of invasive plants, they usually have very abundant seeds producers. They have ways to really have rapid population growth. Usually their seeds are long time survival. Uh, they may last for years and years in the ecosystem. They usually occupy disturbed sites. They're very competitive. And oftentimes they have a lack of native uh, enemies. So they, the seeds were brought over, but the native herbivores or the native uh, insects that ate the plants were left in their home country. So they don't have the natural enemies they would have had to keep them in check. I mentioned that we that plants uh, weeds can have both positive and negative effects. So think for a minute about some of the positive ecological impacts of weeds. We often focus on the negative impacts. You might think of some of those. And then economically or socioeconomically, social and economic impacts could be positive, such as, or negative. So let's take a look at just, I'll just list a few. Let's start with the negative impacts uh, ecological because those are the ones that are often emphasized and easy to, rem to think about. So we when you have invasive species that come in, they reduce the native plant diversity. They usually reduce the forage for livestock and, and wildlife. They often is accelerate erosion, especially the invasion of annuals such as cheatgrass, yellow star thistle and others. They usually uh, accelerate erosion because they reduce the, the soil cover. They also alter fire regimes, which would be an example of cheatgrass, where we start to have much more frequent fires. On the other hand, some weeds are quite good forage and they can provide quite good coverage. I talked about uh, uh, juniper moving in. When it moves in there, that's good cover. Uh, some plants like leafy spurge, although it's bad for cattle, is quite good forage for sheep and goats. Talked about uh, erosion protection such as that that's provided by reed canary grass. Some weeds have beautiful flowers and those flowers are good pollinator resources and some weeds are important uh, for producing honey etc because of the the pollen in their flowers. On the socioeconomic side the negative impacts would be the cost of control which can really be expensive for ranchers and landowners. Uh, it also can create conflicts among neighbors, neighbors that are upset that, they're, that they're, the person across the fence might not be doing what they're supposed to be doing to control their weeds. And then furthermore, both the weeds and the herbicides used to control the weeds can have health impacts. On the flip side of that, the positive socioeconomic impacts might include the weed control jobs or the fire jobs that are created when weeds move in. I mentioned that some of these weeds have 
uh, values such as medicines or honey, uh, St. John's wort, which is a, a, a pretty bad weed on the noxious weed list of many states, also is the same plant that provides St. John's wort the medicine that you can buy in the grocery store. Honey is also, uh, yellow star thistle honey, for example, is, is quite nice. I've had it before. And in California, there's a whole yellow star thistle honey um, industry. And although uh, weeds can cause conflict among neighbors, they can also foster collaboration because it really does take a community to, to manage weeds. We'll just take a little closer look at those. Plant diversity that's a, uh, often reduced by weeds where we, we go from a diverse community to a monoculture. Uh, don't forget that that also affects the animal diversity, and we especially worry about weeds as they might affect uh, uncommon or, or really um, iconic species in an ecosystem. Soil integrity, uh, can, that can go both ways. Generally, we think of weeds as um, removing some of the soil uh, at the surface and, and increasing erosion. Sometimes it can minimize erosion. S certainly weeds, because they change the amount of of so the distribution of uh, biomass at the soil surface can really change water cycling, how much runoff there is, how much water goes into the soil, how much water goes into the rivers. So it affects water cycles also. On the socioeconomic side, remember some people are going to make money uh, doing weed control, but it also costs money. Fire suppression, now that we have cheatgrass in the ecosystems, that's a huge cost on budgets and communities. Um, rehabilitation can also is, is also very expensive to reseed or, or reestablish the uh, plants after a fire, uh, but that's also a benefit. Uh, quite a few companies that are moving in the rest, rehab, rehabilitation and restoration ecology, for example, is a growing track in our degree of rangeland conservation. Socioeconomic, don't forget that there's some social side, such as the loss of recreation values. Uh, very few people want to go hiking through yellow star thistle. When you get some weeds along the banks, it can really uh, interfere with fishing. And if you change the plants and, and animals out there, it can uh, reduce research or, um, activities such as bird watching. Forage losses uh, can be seen by not just livestock, but also wildlife. Remember, some weeds do have forage value, but in general, when invasive species come in, they reduce the forage uh, quality and quantity. Now let's start to turn towards management of these invasive plants. Uh, one good way to think about this is what you can do and how expensive it is varies depending on that sear of invasion, how much the plant has been uh, become aware and taken over the ecosystem. So on the left hand side, when a plant is first introduced, boy, it's really unlikely that someone would even notice it. It's very, very low in abundance. But if in that first proactive phase, of uh, once the seed is introduced and, you, and it's recognized, if you control it then, it costs very little. It's a small area. The plant could be completely eradicated. There's a great story about a local weed supervisor who was working on the salmon river outside of Riggins and he was working up the river one day and he found a new plant and he didn't know what it was. So he brought it home and identified it, it was something that was not native. It was a weed from another community. So he went back out and he just, he killed the whole plot. Who knows what would happen if he had not killed that you know, acre or so. It didn't cost much, didn't take him much time. But if he had not done that, it probably it could have gone all the way up and down the Salmon River. So, so some really being proactive, recognizing plants early and eradicating them is highly effective, very cost effective. Once the plant starts to be commonly recognized, it goes through this active phase of eradication or control. That's that middle bar. Um, actually, weeds become really abundant before the public even knows they're there. So really astute folk, people who know their plants can be important in controlling weeds and, and managing their scattered uh, populations in a very cost-effective way in that active management phase in the middle. Once you get to a point where everybody knows it's a problem, you know, I'd say lots of plants that we have, leafy spurge, spotted knapweed, uh, certainly reed canary grass, they're in the phase where control costs would be just, if we ever wanted to get rid of those plants, the control would just be astronomical if it was even possible. So now we're just in managing local infestations and we're trying to keep those uh, the larger populations from spreading. So let's start by thinking about what you could do at that 
early stages of uh, invasion on the left hand side of the previous chart and that would be uh, maintain a healthy natural plant community when the ecosystems resources are used by native plants it's less likely that an invasive plant would come in and and find a niche and become established so one of the first and most important things of prevention is to maintain a healthy native plant community so prevention um, also would include considering vectors of introduction. So any land that you manage, think about how might seeds get in there? Do, do, does equipment need to be uh, washed? Uh, Weed-free hay is a way of preventing invasions. Um, any, anything you can do to, to minimize introduction and minimize the disturbance, disturbances that would favor weed. That's a very important stage in, in uh, land management that I think is often forgotten is to think about how might weeds get onto one's land. Uh, also early in the phase, you want to think about early detection, uh, develop uh, strategies for really early detection. That means become aware of plants in your community, uh, making sure that you know the native the noxious weeds that might come in and then uh, and, and really get on it because that only after a plant is in really small populations can it be actually eradicated. Beyond that, uh, it's important to track uh, weeds for planting, such as doing surveys, collect information about the weed, try to make sure it's, it's understood, document its growth, growth requirements, uh, identify sites that are susceptible to weed invasion. Dr. Tim Prather, who's at the University of Idaho, he has several really good models that look for the, the climatic conditions and the soil conditions that might favor specific kinds of weeds. So his goal is that sometime you might be able to go to, on your land and, and map sites that are susceptible to weeds. And then again, evaluate progress in managing weeds. If, if you do some control, making sure that you're making progress and the weed is actually being controlled. Weed mapping is a part of that survey. Uh, delineate the extent to which weeds are out there. Any control efforts that you've taken, were they successful? And then monitor spread over time. Once mapping and surveying is done, it's important to continue monitoring and evaluation. So was the weed population adequately suppressed? What were the non-target effects? Were the land management goals met? Uh, does it need to be repeated or modified? So once the data is taken, it's important to take to look at that data and, and see if the um, if the planning effort is 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 working. Don't forget that weed management should occur in an integrated uh, phase where looking at all the resources that are at the table to try to suppress a weed. So ideas of integrated weed management are important, whether that be chemical with herbicides, biocontrol with insects or other agents, cultural such as that with prescribed fire or targeted grazing, or whether it's mechanical with um, shovels and, and plows and shredders. All of those have van advantages and um, uses on ecosystems. So when planning, how to manage a weed, it's important to think about an integrated weed management strategy. And finally, not just integrated, but also coordinated. Weeds don't care about land ownership boundaries. They don't care about fences. So it's important to think about all the people in a watershed or in an area that could be engaged to leverage resources, such as time, equipment, money, expertise. I once had the pleasure of going to a weed management uh, meeting in near Weezer, and that group was really effective uh, because they really used the skills they each had and combined them to be effective. Uh, for example, some people had four wheelers with sprays on them, spray equipment on them. Others had the expertise to do the spraying. They had their their license. Some didn't have much expertise, but they had some money to buy the herbicides. Other had time. One person of this group had a plane and a private, he was a private pilot and he and someone else went up over the weed management area. And after the spray day that they had had, they, um, they took pictures of the areas that had been sprayed. So that was the way that they mapped them with those pictures. They could see the blue dye and they could see what areas had been sprayed. Um, I, I also love that one of the folks that hosted it, she um, had her garage, that was where the meeting was, and she said, don't forget that I'm an important part of this too because I made lunch. So whether it be that you made lunch or, or you helped map the area or you got on a, a, a four-wheeler and you sprayed up weeds or, or you were some part of the equation, that's where that leveraging of resources is so important. Also, at least under the noxious weed law and in Idaho, you cannot get money from state or federal agencies. You cannot get state or federal funds uh, 
to support weed management unless you're part of a coordinated weed management group because this is so important to work with your neighbors on this project. Then don't forget it's not just about the weed. I think we get very fixated about the populations of weeds and what is control for one weed. It's really about the whole land, the whole the whole ecosystem. In in other words, uh, think about what that uh, treatment is going to do to the rest of the ecosystem and how can you maintain the integrity of the ecosystem and, and suppress the weed. So it's a real ecological uh, approach and it's difficult, takes a lot of knowledge, a local knowledge and an ecological um, on information. So that's it. Those are just some really broad ideas about invasive plant management, but I hope out of this you understand what noxious plants are, what invasive plants are, and how important uh, understanding the abundance of that plant, what your options are for management, and doing it in a coordinated fashion are.